From New York, this is Democracy Now! The demands are no eviction of the residents of Sheikh Jarrah, no demolishing of houses in Jerusalem, and prohibiting the eviction of Jerusalemites and asking them to demolish their homes. They should stop demolishing homes. As the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas holds for a fourth day, tension remains high across the region. On Sunday, dozens of Jewish settlers backed by Israeli security forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. We'll go to the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, where Palestinians are facing eviction from their homes so Jewish settlers can move in. Then the Biden administration extends temporary protected status for Haitians living in the United States. While we're very glad this represents a reprieve, a temporary reprieve, for 150,000 Haitians who may be eligible for TPS, we understand that we need more from this administration, we need more from this Congress, we need permanent protections for all migrants, regardless of country condition or personal history. And this week marks the one year since the police murder of George Floyd. We'll speak to one of the lawyers for the Floyd family, Lee Merritt, who also represents the family of Ahmaud Arbery. Now he's taking on the case of Ronald Green, who died in Louisiana two years ago. Police initially told Green's family he died in a car crash. But new video shows he died after being electrocuted, beat, and dragged by police officers following a traffic stop. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A ceasefire between Israel and Hamas continues to hold as Egyptian mediators try to maintain the relative calm that follows Israel's brutal 11-day assault on the Gaza Strip, which killed at least 248 Palestinians, including 66 children. But tensions in the region remained high over the weekend as Israeli forces and settlers entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in occupied East Jerusalem multiple times since Friday, with local outlets reporting reporting attacks on Palestinian worshipers. Gazans have begun to clean up the wreckage as they surveyed the devastating aftermath of the Israeli bombardment. We are looking at our memories, the houses, the apartments. We lost everything we own, from furniture to all of our memories and childhood memories. Everything is destroyed. The U.N. said it's launching an aid appeal for the Gaza Strip, where fears are mounting COVID-19 could further spike after residents were forced to flee their homes and shelter together from the bombing. The U.S. has said it would contribute to helping rebuild Gaza, while refusing to condemn the death and destruction wrought by Israel. Meanwhile, massive protests and solidarity with the Palestinian people took place around the globe again this weekend, including here in the United States. An estimated 180,000 people took part in a London march. This is a demonstrator speaking from a protest in Paris. France has, for example, advantageous agreements with the Israeli state at the import level. And what is important is that all countries who don't respect human rights should be sanctioned, as any country would be when they don't respect human rights. And today, what is incomprehensible is that Israel still benefits from total impunity. We'll have more on the situation in Gaza and the region after headlines with Palestinian writer and poet Mohammed el Kurd in Sheikh Jarrah. India recorded over 4,400 new COVID fatalities today, bringing its official death toll over 300,000, just the third country in the world to pass the tragic milestone after the United States and Brazil. Its daily cases have dropped significantly from earlier this month, with around 220,000 reported today. Experts say both numbers are vast undercounts. Latin America has now recorded over a million COVID-19 deaths, around 30 percent of the world's death toll, despite accounting for just 8 percent of the global population. 
Brazil represents around 45 percent of the region's fatalities. On Friday, the state of Maranhão issued a fine to far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro for refusing to respect local health rules by holding a mass gathering and not wearing a face mask. This all comes, as the World Health Organization said Friday, the true global death toll for COVID-19 is likely two to three times higher than official reports. Here in the United States, the seven-day rolling average of daily coronavirus cases has fallen below 30,000 for the first time since last June, with daily deaths also at a similar level to last summer. Hospitalizations are also way down. At least eight states—Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Vermont and Hawaii—have now given at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose to 70 percent of their adult population. Here in New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio just announced schools will open in full in September with no remote option. The Biden administration's granting more than 100,000 Haitians in the U.S. the chance to gain temporary protected status, or TPS, which includes work permits and protection from deportation while Haiti suffers a political crisis. The Haitian president, Jovenel Moïse, continues to refuse calls to step down, even as human rights groups report he's sanctioned attacks against civilians in impoverished neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince, with targeted assassinations and threats against government critics carried out with impunity. President Biden deported more Haitians during his first two months than Donald Trump did in the last year of his presidency. We'll have more on the Biden administration's decision to grant TPS to Haitian immigrants later in the broadcast. International leaders are accusing Belarus of state terrorism and hijacking after it ordered a commercial flight be diverted to Minsk using a fake bomb threat so it could arrest a journalist on board critical of President Alexander Lukashenko. The Ryanair jet had been flying from Athens to Lithuania, where 26-year-old journalist Roman Protasevich has been living. He ran social media for the outlet Nexta, which covered the violent crackdown on anti-government protests in Belarus last year following the highly contested re-election of Lukashenko. Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya, who also operates in exile from Lithuania, spoke out against the arrest. Today, Lukashenko personally caused an international scandal, used military aircraft against civilians of Belarus and European countries to reprise a single person. No one else is safe. Anyone can be in Roman Protasevich place. In Burma, Aung San Suu Kyi appeared in person at a court hearing for the first time since she and other officials were deposed in a February 1st military coup. She faces a range of charges that the United Nations and others have condemned as politically motivated, including illegally possessing walkie-talkies and violating a state secrets law. Suu Kyi's legal team says she has no access to newspapers, is only partly aware of events that have taken place since her arrest. A local rights group says over 800 people have been killed and 4,300 arrested since February 1st, as mass protests shook the country. Meanwhile, rebel fighters say they killed dozens of Burmese security force members over the weekend. In Bangladesh, prominent investigative journalist Rosina Islam, who reported on corruption in the government's response to the pandemic, has been granted bail after her arrest last week prompted international outrage. Under the Colonial Era Official Secrets Act, which carries a possible death penalty, press freedom groups are calling for charges to be dropped immediately. A severe cyclone is brewing in the Bay of Bengal, is forecast to slam into northeast India Wednesday with 100 mile per hour winds. This comes just one week after another cyclone battered India's western state of Gujarat as the most powerful storm to hit the region in two decades, killing at least 140 people. Over the weekend, authorities said 61 bodies have been recovered from a barge carrying oil workers that sank in the Arabian Sea last week. In the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, at least 15 people were killed, thousands more forced to flee their homes as lava from a volcano near the city of Goma reached their villages and neighborhoods. Residents blamed the government for failing to warn them of the impending eruption. 
I was with my husband, who is too old, and he didn't want to leave the house because he was sick. He couldn't walk. I said to myself, I can't go alone. We've been married for the best and for the worst. I went back to at least try to get him out, but couldn't. I ran away, and he got burned inside. I don't know what to do. I curse this day. Lava from the eruption flowed to within a mile of Goma's main airport, but the city of one million people appears to have been spared. The United States experienced another weekend of deaths and injuries from at least 12 mass shootings. At least 11 people were killed and 69 injured from gun violence in New Jersey, South Carolina, Georgia, Ohio and Minnesota. The nonprofit Gun Violence Archive reported 2021 as the second straight year the U.S. has seen over 60 mass shootings in the the month of May, with 229 mass shootings recorded since the start of the year. In Minneapolis, community members, civil rights leaders and George Floyd's family gathered to mark the first anniversary of Floyd's murder, ahead of the May 25th anniversary Tuesday. This is local community organizer and pastor Carmen Means. So what has changed? The game hasn't changed. The game remains the same. But what has changed is that you've been activated on a whole nother level. There's a warrior on the inside of you that was activated on 525 on a whole nother level. George Floyd's murder at the hands of the Minneapolis police set off a nationwide uprising and global movement calling for an end to racism and for the defense of black lives. President Biden will host Floyd's family at the White House on Tuesday. We will speak one of the Floyd family attorneys, Lee Merritt, later in the broadcast. A warning to our viewers, this next story contains disturbing footage of police violence. In Tennessee, a newly published video shows officers at the Marshall County Jail pressing a hogtied man into the floor with their knees on his back for nearly four minutes and taunting him as he pleaded with officers that he could not breathe. 48-year-old William Jeanette, who was white, died during the violent encounter. The Marshall County Medical Examiner's Office ruled Jeanette's death a homicide, a combination of drug intoxication and asphyxiation. Despite the ruling, a grand jury declined to indict any of the officers. The newly surfaced video shows Jeanette shouted, help, they're going to kill me, as officers cursed at him, with one replying, you shouldn't be able to breathe, you stupid bastard. And in media news, shareholders have approved the purchase of Tribune Publishing by New York hedge fund Alden Global Capital for $633 million. Tribune Publishing's many newspapers include The Chicago Tribune, The Baltimore Sun and The New York Daily News. Alden, which already owns around 100 newspapers and 200 publications, is known for making major cuts to local papers in pursuit of profit. The outlet More Perfect Union reports Alden slashed the staff of the Denver Post by 75 percent and closed six newsrooms in 2020. About half of daily local newspaper circulation in the United States is now controlled by hedge funds. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United Nations is appealing to the world to address the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza as a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas is holding for a fourth day. The 11-day Israeli assault on Gaza killed 248 Palestinians, including 66 children there. More than 1,700 people were injured. The U.N. is estimating at least 6,000 residents of Gaza were left homeless after their homes were bombed by Israel, which has maintained a blockade on Gaza for the past 14 years. Meanwhile, tension remains high across the region. On Sunday, dozens of Jewish settlers, backed by Israeli security forces, stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, the third holiest site in Islam. On Friday, Israeli security forces fired stun guns and rubber bullets at Palestinians outside the mosque. Israeli prosecutors have also filed terrorism charges against three Jewish men who pulled a Palestinian man out of his car in the city of Bat Yam two weeks ago and viciously beat him. 
A police official said, quote, the three defendants engaged in inciting the mob before the victim arrived. They stole, looted from and destroyed stores owned by Arabs. When they saw an Arab, they carried out an extremely merciless beating, unquote. Some initial press reports had mistakenly said the victim was Jewish. Meanwhile, in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah, Israeli authorities are continuing their campaign to forcibly evict Palestinians from their homes so Jewish settlers can move in. We go now to Sheikh Jarrah, where we're joined by Mohammed al Kurd. He is a Palestinian activist and poet who's organizing to save his family's home. His debut book, Rifka, will be released by Haymarket Books later this year. Mohammed, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you talk about the ceasefire now in its fourth day, what it means, and the wreckage in its wake? And then we'll talk about what's happening to you, your family, and the other residents of Sheikh Jarrah. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. It's good to be back. Uh, I think the ceasefire means a lot of things. First, it means that the resistance, the Palestinian resistance, um, be it grassroots or otherwise, has, has been able to accomplish um, its own conditions, has been able to withstand a brutal nuclear superpower that is um, senseless, senselessly carpet bombing a strip where people, two million people are besieged. But um, in its fourth day, we are seeing that the Israeli authorities did not respect the ceasefire conditions. Um, Al-Aqsa Mosque has been in more than once. There has been a mass arrest campaign, and Sheikh Jarrah is still under an illegal blockade, and colonial violence is still business as usual um, in occupied Palestine at large. Explain in more detail what happened at the Al-Aqsa Mosque starting on Friday, and explain the significance of this mosque in Islam. Well, Al-Aqsa Mosque, for um, Palestinians who are Muslim, uh, it's one. It's the holiest site in Palestine, and it's the third holiest site in Islam. And it is continuously raided and stormed by the Israeli police um, and army, um, the occupation forces working with Israeli settlers that are usually armed. And what happens is that oftentimes worshippers are met with brute force inside the mosque. This is stun grenades. Um, rubber coated bullets, sometimes live ammunition. People are detained, um, harassed, hit, brutalized. And the images we have been seeing of this violence are not unique. What's been unique is that finally Palestinians are making noise about what's happening. We're finally recording, and the world is finally listening. Um, yesterday, over, I believe, 100 and something Israeli settlers stormed the mosque. Um, to incite violence, to provoke Palestinians. And of course, the occupation authorities ransacked the mosque, ransacked the worshippers, and wounded many. Explain, Sheikh Sharar. It seems now the world has heard about your neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Um, your own situation, you and your twin sister, Mona. Um, I wanted to play that clip that went viral for people to understand um, what's taking place. But first, if you can put it into context, how is it possible that a Jewish settler has been living in your house for years? Exp go back in time. Of course. I mean, um, I think uh, there is uh, two things to be said about Sheikh Jarrah, the then and the now. The then is that um, it is a microcosm of the Israeli reality, the Israeli settler colonialism in Palestine at large. It is absurd to people to hear that there's a settler from Long Island that's squatting in my house, but he wouldn't be able to do that without being emboldened by the Israeli occupation forces, by an Israeli judicial system that is inherently colonial and supremacist, and by American tax dollars. Um, the person in my house has been there, much like many Israelis have have inhabited homes that belong to Palestinians that were thrown out of them, that were massacred, that were forced to flee. Um, and this is the situation in the entire neighborhood. You have um, 
settler organizations that are registered in the United States that are working and collaborating with the Israeli authorities to fabricate documents to throw out Palestinians. I think it's important to put in context that we are a community of refugees um, that is facing a billionaire-backed settler organization that is working um, in, in different countries. And what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah is not uh, just in Sheikh Jarrah. It's happening in Silwan, where more than 800 um, Palestinians are about to be thrown made homeless and a hundred homes will be um, destroyed, demolished. It's happening in the South Hebron Hills. It's happening in Isawiya, where the Israeli authorities are building, quote unquote, national parks um, to behave as colonial borders, to prevent um, natural community growth in Palestinian communities. Um, there's many and a million ways in which Palestinians in Jerusalem are dispossessed. And sometimes it's a judicial system, sometimes it's artillery and weapons, and sometimes it's national parks. But it all behaves in the same way. I also want to just make a quick note that Sheikh Jarrah has been under an illegal blockade for the past three weeks. No Palestinians, all, no Palestinians, not even medics, not even journalists, are allowed into the neighborhood except the people that live there. And even those of us who live there are still harassed and questioned and shoved around. I've been shoved around more times than I can count, and that's been the same reality for other people. This is all happening. The neighborhood is blockaded, um, barricaded with cement barriers. Meanwhile, Israeli settlers can just walk in, no questions asked. And oftentimes, if not most of the time, they are armed with their rifles or pistols. So I want to go to that viral video um, showing your twin sister, Muna, uh, confronting the Israeli settler who's been living in part of your home for 12 years. <laughs> Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you're you're not it's easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, ya ammi. So this Jacob says, if I don't steal it, someone else will. Where does he live in your house? So he lives. So the the houses, the 28 houses of the Sheikh Jarrah um, housing project, were built in 1956, and we have built an extension to that to our house in the year 2000. The extension, of course, was closed immediately upon um, building, because 94% um, of building permits um, presented by Palestinians in Jerusalem get rejected. Um, actually, the the councilman. Um, who rejects and accepts these um, permits is the same person that went viral for another video saying that their goal is to make East Jerusalem like West Jerusalem. And if it happens at the expense of the Palestinians, it's no big deal. So Yaakov from Long Island, Jacob Fauci, lives in that extension of my house and has lived there for, I think, a decade now. So let's go to what happened in Gaza. Uh, the Hamas-Israel ceasefire, you've got um, over 200 Palestinians killed, over 240 Palestinians killed. About a quarter of them are children. More than 60 of those dead in Gaza are children as a result of the Israeli bombardment. Now, President Biden says um, that the U.S. will uh, contribute to rebuilding Gaza. I want to play that clip for you. Uh, it, uh, President Biden saying that they will contribute money, and of course the United Nations is also calling for a Gaza rebuilding fund. Your response? Um, I think uh, you know. I, I believe uh, there was a, there was a condition that uh, the resistance must be disarmed, and I just think it's uh, ridiculous that the United States of all countries would talk about disarming um, what they call terrorism when they have unleashed more terror onto the world than any other nation. And I think uh, if we're going to talk about disarming terrorism, I think Israel is a great place to start. Um, the world seeing uh, Gaza get ga carpet bombed um, was a great 
presentation. Of course, a heart-wrenching uh, and terrible presentation, but nonetheless, a good presentation that the Israeli um, meth of self-defense is more and more penetrable, that they're not really defending against anything. And those manipulations of language, those red herrings they throw in the way of Palestinian advocacy are not strong enough to contrast the images of them targeting densely populated civilian areas, are not um, strong enough to, co to contrast um, the intent, the, the confessions made by Israeli officials about, um, you know, flattening the trip or venting out their frustrations by uh, leveling uh, residential towers. So I think, uh, I think Israel is losing the battle in the public eye, and I hope no more Palestinians have to be killed before the world um, takes action against Israelis and against the Israeli authorities, the occupation authorities, who have been getting away with impunity for decades. Is there an Israeli peace movement that is expressing solidarity with the Palestinians? I don't think there's an Israeli peace movement that, that directly addresses um, the Israeli occupation authorities as a form of colonial violence. And I think that's um, where the issues stem. I think the, any Israeli peace movement uh, is, uh, you know, intentions are welcome, but they must reflect the wishes and the self-determination and the self-articulation of the Palestinian street, the voices of the Palestinian youth. And I don't think, I don't think, I don't believe that's present nowadays. The significance of the overall solidarity around the world, what that has meant for you. I mean, we just uh, played a clip of someone in London, something like 180,000 people protested. That was rather, uh, yes, that was in Paris. Yes, Amy, that was um, the, the videos in London and Paris all over the world have been heartwarming to me as a Palestinian and uh, to many, many, many Palestinians to see this. Uh, huge, unprecedented shift in public opinion. And we know that it will have reverberations um, and accumulations in the coming future. We know that these protests were, are going to continue and um, be developed into actions and sanctions and boycotts and initiatives and letters. Um, and I ask the people who are protesting to continue doing so, because um, we must be stubborn in the face of Israeli colonialism. Um, we're also already seeing punishment um, for these um, advocacy campaigns, for these protests. 1,400 Palestinians who hold Israeli citizenships have um, already been arrested in the past two weeks. Yesterday, the Israeli authorities um, announced a campaign of what they called law and order, where they will be arresting um, 500 more Palestinians to, and I quote, even the score. Of course, no Israelis that took part in the lynch mobs were arrested or will be arrested in that campaign. Um, to look at this mathematically, if you're arresting 500 Palestinians, that means you're terrorizing 500 families, 500 streets where you'll be ransacking, um, raiding people's homes, terrorizing them. This sends a clear message to us Palestinians who have been feeling a sense of national unity across historical Palestine. If you protest colonial violence, you'll be met with more colonial violence. But it is also this campaign of, quote unquote, law and order is also an indication that the Israeli occupation authorities are losing control. Mohamed al Kurd, I want to thank you for being with us, writer and poet from Jerusalem. Uh, he's organizing to save his family's home in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, it's the first anniversary of the police murder of George Floyd. We'll speak with one of the family's lawyers, who's now taking on the case of Ronald Green, who died in Louisiana two years ago. But people around the country are just learning about what actually happened now after video was released, because police originally told the family he died in a, plane, in a car crash. In fact, he died after police electrocuted, beat and dragged him for a, an unspecified traffic stop. Stay with us. Thank you. 
ты жив Мин баб ла баб Амсал маса я гариб Утфаттахат ли жирох Я гайн ла тетмай The Night Has Fallen Down by Rimbana. <clears throat> this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're going to turn now to what's taking place. Um, uh, a warning to our audience, the story contains disturbing footage of police violence. New body cam footage is raising more questions about the deadly arrest of a black man in Louisiana two years ago. It was May 10, 2019. The Associated Press first obtained video of Louisiana state troopers electrocuting, beating and dragging Ronald Green during a traffic stop after a high-speed chase in the city of Monroe. Family members said police originally told them Green died in a car accident. They made no mention of the officers using force. Well, last week, the Associated Press released portions of a 46-minute video that showed two troopers shocking Green with a stun gun through his car window, then dragging him out of his car on the side of a dark rural road, as Green tells them, quote, "'Officer, I'm scared. I'm your brother. I'm scared.'" One of the officers puts Green in a chokehold and punches him in the face, while another can be heard calling him a stupid MFR, using the full words. Green was shocked again, tased again, while lying on the ground in handcuffs, and ordered to stay on his stomach as he desperately tried to roll over. Again, a warning to our viewers, this clip from the video is disturbing. After the officers beat Ronald Green, the AP reports they left him unattended, face down, for more than nine minutes, as officers refused to render aid, instead washing blood off their own hands and faces. Green arrived dead at the local hospital with two taser prongs in his back. Again, police initially told Green's family he died in a car crash. A recently released coroner's report says his head injuries and the way he was restrained were factors in his death. Ronald Green was 49 years old and worked as a barber. He'd recently gone into remission after battling cancer for two years and was reportedly on his way to meet his wife in Florida when he was stopped by the Louisiana State Police Troopers. Green's family has filed a federal wrongful death lawsuit, and his death is now being investigated by the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, along with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of Louisiana and the FBI. On Friday, Louisiana State Police released more body cam videos from the arrest of Ronald Green. The Louisiana State Troopers and the deadly arrest were all part of Troop F, all of them white. Trooper Corey York, who is seen on video dragging Green by the shackles on his ankles, even though Green is not resisting, got a 50-hour suspension and is returned to active duty. Trooper Chris Hollingsworth, who's heard in the video saying he, quote, he beat the ever-living F out of Green, later died in a car crash hours after he learned he would be fired for his actions. Trooper Dakota DeMoss has since been arrested in connection with a separate allegation of excessive force while handcuffing a motorist. Lawyers for Green's family have also called for the arrest of Officer Floyd McElroy. This is the mother of Ronald Green, Mona Hardin, speaking to CNN. The state of Louisiana has no credibility. They're an organized crime ring that's gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. You can see this time and time again. The burning of my son, 
you can you can just see it from very beginning to end. It implicates those who are on there and then some. And it's just like Mr. Merritt said, you know, they have no credibility. They continue to try to shy away from and, and shine the light on other uh, issues that has nothing to do with my son's murder. Hmm. I'm disgusted. I just haven't grieved and I haven't even screamed. I haven't cried. And they have, there's no empathy for, for how they do another human being and they let the families continue to suffer. Mm. These latest revelations about the case of Ronald Green come just days before the first anniversary of the killing of George Floyd, May 25, 2020, when police officer Derek Chauvin murdered Floyd by kneeling on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds during an arrest in Minneapolis. George Floyd's family and activists are calling for today to be a day of action, a day to urge federal lawmakers to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. The push is part of a week-long series of events organized to honor the life and legacy of George Floyd. For more, we're joined by Lee Merritt, civil rights attorney representing the family of Ronald Green, also part of the legal team for the family of George Floyd, as well as for the families of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Lee. Um, I want to start with the latest revelations in the Ronald Green case. Again, he was killed two years ago. But it was just this week that first AP released video footage and then the Louisiana State Police released footage. But talk about this case, what the family understood at the time, this cancer survivor, um, and what they know now. Well, the family was told initially that Ron had died in a car accident. Um, it took just a mild a bit of investigation to discover that was true. The family demanded to see his body, and his body was covered in not only dirt and blood, but bruises from uh, his head and from the injuries that he had sustained during the beating, uh, with no real narrative to explain it. The medical examiner was not given the proper narrative about what happened on the side of the road, and that video was obscured. It took about a year and a half before the family was finally allowed to see the video this past September. And, um, and then we realized you know, the full extent of just how brutal and gratuitous the violence that was directed at him was. Uh, but by that time, the Louisiana State Police apparatus had already meted out its punishment, which was that 50-hour suspension for one officer, Corey York, and one termination for uh, Chris Hollingsworth, who uh, went on to die in a single car accident uh, the same day he was terminated. And so, when people saw this AP footage, I mean, obviously, the parallels are horrific. Um, talk about Troop F, um, the calling for its dismantling, this group that stopped him. I mean, they were—they stopped him for an unspecified traffic uh, violation. He sped away. They went after him. And then, when they got him, uh, he kept saying, I am afraid. I appreciate that you took your time to lay out the names of the officers. One officer that you left out, and was a very important uh, clip for us, was the video uh, body cam footage of Lieutenant John Clary. He's the supervisor who came to the scene after these officers from Troop F, uh, specifically Corey York, Chris Hollingsworth, and Dakota DeMoss, uh, were, uh, had already set upon um, Ronald. And when Lieutenant Clary arrived to the scene, these men were still actively engaged in torturing a, a then handcuffed and hogtied Ronald Green. They were still apparently paint, spraying him with pepper spray, uh, mocking him in the process. You could hear him saying things like, yeah, it hurts, doesn't it? Uh, and Lieutenant Clary approved their actions. He ratified their actions on, on behalf of Louisiana State Police. It's so important that that supervisor came to the scene, observed everything that was going on, and gave everyone an attaboy, because it reveals that this was, in fact, uh, not only the culture, but the de facto policy for the Louisiana State Police. And it's an open policy that we all know. When we're honest with ourselves, we know that when a black man runs from police in places like Louisiana, you can expect a, a, a gratuitous beatdown. Uh, and, and although it's not the official policy, uh, that, that supervisor's response to it taking place and then the cover-up that took place for the next two years but for the AP leak uh, is evidence that this is accepted culture in the state of Louisiana. So you're calling for the arrest of Corey York, John Clary, Dakota DeMoss? 
We're calling for those arrests. Uh, and we think that there should be both state and federal charges. The the Union Parish District Attorney, who was responsible for reviewing the case, he said he immediately observed that this was a criminal matter that should be referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and he was right. These were clear civil rights violations, constitutional violations from Ronald Green, and um, not only by the officers on the scene, but by the uh, the cover-up, the, the supervisors who, who facilitated the behavior. But there still remains Louisiana state codes, Louisiana Constitution, and protections for citizens like Ronald Green. Uh, and there must be accountability at a state level as well, not either or, but both. And so we're looking for criminal charges to move forward against these officers at the state level and at the federal level. Talk about your conversation with John Belton, the district attorney uh, for the 3rd Judicial District in Louisiana. So, Mr. Belton was—he uh, um, he had the concern that by presenting this case to a union parish uh, grand jury at the time that Trump uh, um, administration was still in office, that it would be unlikely uh, that a, a very conservative sort of jury pool would return a, um, an indictment against these officers. More importantly, these officers were involved in other cases in his jurisdiction as, as witnesses, as investigators, as reporters. So there, there's a conflict in the Union Parish um, um, district, or I, I should say, yeah, Union Parish, for these officers. So it would be appropriate, we believe, for this, this uh, for Mr. Belton to recuse himself. That's what we ask that he do, uh, and that a special prosecutor uh, be allowed to pursue state charges. And then the um, the history of the Louisiana governor. Yeah. So the Louisiana governor. Um, it's important to know that that although he's a Democratic governor, uh, and um, this you know, is John made, Bell Edwards. Yeah, John Bell Edwards has paid lip service to the Black Lives Matter movement for the students at places like Louisiana Louisiana State University. His father is a sheriff. His grandfather is a sheriff. He signed in the uh, Blue Lives Matter. Uh, legislation that made it a hate crime to target police officers in Louisiana. Uh, and and his, his actions have shown that he's willing to go to bat for law enforcement, but has failed to take, you know, concrete steps to really remedy very real issues of violence, mass incarceration, and race, systemic racism within the Louisiana State Police Department. So, uh, again, he, he's moved towards the black community with, with lip service, especially over the last year. But in terms of tangible, concrete results, we've seen very little. And we're, we're looking for specific actions in this case, including uh, him instructing the attorney general to vigorously prosecute these men for, for the local state charges and participating fully with a federal review of his, of his state police. Not only this troop, but the culture within the Louisiana State Troopers Office generally. Can you talk about how racism has shaped law enforcement, particularly in the in the South? You have talked about the origin of the slave patrols. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Now. Oh, the issue of how racism has shaped law and sure. influenced law enforcement. Sure. And, and I don't think I've seen a more graphic example of the continuation of the slave culture than this scene. It invokes the images of, of slave catchers hunting down a runaway slave. And it was—it's really from that spring that this culture drew from. You had to punish runaway slaves in places like Louisiana if they ran to send an example to other enslaved persons that they're not allowed to run, run or they would receive this kind of violence. That culture, that training uh, is, is still alive and well today in a way that I think a lot of Americans will find, you know, uh, very off-putting. Uh, but, you know, it, it hasn't gone anywhere in, in, the, in, in the hundreds of years that this uh, culture has set in. That whole issue of, in fact, Ronald Green being hogtied. We see in this video that was released by AP, uh, one of those police officers, you can tell us his name, who puts his knee on his back. And again, the parallels with George Floyd. In this case, um, though, he was just left to die for nine minutes while they washed his blood off of them. And it's, it's so important to note that even after this video has come out, the Louisiana State Police has described the incident as awful but lawful. They, they don't have any shame in what, they, the, what we're watching there. They don't, they're, they're ashamed that we all have to watch it, but they don't believe that the, the use of force was gratuitous. They, they believe that 
because of Ronald Green's, according to their own statements, because of Ronald Green's failure to immediately pull his car over, that the subsequent violent acts, the repeated tasing, uh, the torture, despite him being handcuffed and fully compliant, was appropriate. And that is the kind of thing that still goes on goes on in Louisiana State, State Troopers' Office. So it's important that as we start to push towards remedy, that first, everyone involved and this attack in the cover-up is held criminally accountable, but there must be a pattern and practice review of that entire policing apparatus. If 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 the culture and the the de facto policies and procedures are constitutionally violative, then we must take affirmative steps, actual actions to ensure to to ensure the safety of Black and Brown Louisianans. Again, this Troop F, at 66 Troop F members, just six are black. The area they patrol is 40 percent African American. And that's correct. And, and this troop is notorious for brutality in the region. Uh, the officers who were involved in this violence went on, after the death of Ronald Green, uh, to participate in the brutalization and even death of other members of the Louisiana community. Uh, you mentioned in your opening that one of the officers, uh, Dakota De Moss, is facing criminal charges, but not as it relates to the murder of Ronald Green or even the aggravated assault of Ronald Green, before a completely separate incident. That is also true of Chris Hollingsworth. Before he passed away, it was discovered that he had other incidents of violence attached to him that the leadership structure in Louisiana helped to cover up for. I think in the coming days and weeks, we're going to find a litany of violence and cover up and corruption within the Louisiana State Police Department. And it's, it's important that we don't turn our heads away. But the same way that the community focused on accountability for George Floyd, we need to uh, hone in and focus on accountability for Ronald Green and the restructuring of the legal uh, law enforcement system in Louisiana. So you represent so many of these families in Minneapolis last night. Community members, civil rights leaders, George Floyd's families gathered to mark the first anniversary of his murder. Um, that The anniversary is actually Tuesday. This is local community organizer and pastor Carmen Means. So what has changed? The game hasn't changed. The game remains the same. But what has changed is that you've been activated on a whole nother level. There's a warrior on the inside of you that was activated on 525 on a whole nother level. So, so President Biden will host the Floyd family tomorrow on the anniversary at the White House. And this is the week, um, the deadline for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, supposedly originally the family demanding that it be passed by now. Um, you have New Jersey Senator Cory Booker said he believed it would. He's negotiating um, with Senator Scott of South Carolina. What is happening with this and the significance of this meeting at the White House tomorrow? On, on behalf of the families that I represent, including George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Ronald Green, Jamel Roberson, Tatiana Jefferson, and so many more, uh, we've been in contact with uh, Cory Booker and, and invested in the uh, passing of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, we believe that a compromise bill that will take take some very radical and necessary steps, uh, a bill that, that Democrats and Republicans should be proud of as a first step, uh, will will be passed um, uh, relatively soon. However, it's, it's so important that we emphasize that it is just one step to move the deadliest police culture in the modern world closer to, um, you know, uh, something that reflects a culture that appreciates human rights for all. Um, you know, there's so many more steps that need to be taken, uh, but I, I, I am proud of the work of, of Cory Booker and, and, and uh, the, the United States Senate and uh, the Biden leadership in working with families to come up with some solutions, some immediate solutions. It's been far too long uh, before, before we tackled this issue of American policing. And I, I think we'll, uh, it will be a relief that we're moving in the right direction a year after George Floyd's death. Apparently, the sticking point, um, Republicans uh, demanding um, that there not be qualified immunity for police. Explain this concept. Yeah. I honestly think it's most—I don't think the Republicans are so hell-bent on uh, keeping qualified immunity out. I think that the stronger aspect, or one of the more important aspects of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is the section that allows federal, the federal government to bring charges against officers 
for reckless behavior. Right now, the standard is just intentional. And I'll get back to qualified immunity, but right now, the this, this, this standard is just intentional acts before the federal government's uh, authority to intervene is invoked. Uh, we wanted to expand. Part of the goal of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was to expand federal authority to hold police officers accountable, which states often fail. Uh, I don't believe that part of the, the, the bill will pass. Uh, the compromise is, though, I, 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 um, from my talks with uh, Mr. Booker and others working on, on this legislation, qualified immunity will, will end. And qualified immunity is an unnecessary shield, uh, a judicially created shield for police officers uh, to avoid accountability, civil accountability. And um, moving the barrier of qualified immunity um, away from families so that they can hold municipalities accountable uh, for their, their policies and practices that are, uh, are, are violent and, and, and detrimental to the black community is also a, a huge part into something that so many people gathered for, marched for, organized around, passed on a local level, and I think that we'll see it passed federally as well. Lee Merritt, we want to thank you for being with us, civil rights attorney representing the family of Ronald Green, also the families of Ahmaud Arbery, who was out for a jog when he was killed, um, as well as uh, George Floyd. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we look at TPS, temporary protected status, being granted to 100,000 Haitians. What does this mean? Stay with us. Racist, sexist boy by the Linda Lindas. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show looking at the Biden administration's move to extend TPS, that's temporary protected status, to more than 100,000 Haitians in the United States for the next 18 months. The new order applies to any Haitian who's currently living in the U.S. The Biden administration had been facing increasing criticism for deporting more Haitians during his first two months than Donald Trump did in the last year of his presidency even though Homeland Security officials privately acknowledge that deported Haitian immigrants, quote, may face harm upon return to Haiti. Haitians first received protected status following the 2010 earthquake. Haiti's now facing a major political crisis. The Haitian president, Jovenel Moïse, has refused calls to step down even as human rights groups report he's sanctioned attacks against civilians in poor neighborhoods of Port-au-Prince, with targeted assassinations and threats against government critics carried out with impunity. We're joined now by Nana Gyampi. She is executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, which has been a lead organization in the push for TPS for Haiti. This came out over the weekend on uh, the significance of TPS for 100,000 Haitians. Thank you, Amy, for having me. It really is significant. It is in terms of a reprieve. It's relief. It's a break for people who have been looking over their shoulders, who have been worried and concerned about what happens if they're not given this relief and either become undocumented or be de detained and deported back to Haiti. So it's a break, but it's, that's all it is, is a break. And we obviously want more. So talk about how you organized for this. So clearly, it wasn't just Baji. There are other organizations that were involved, um, including organizations that are led by Haitians, focused on Haitians, with the Haitian community as well as other Black-led organizations and other immigrant rights and civil rights organizations. This has been a long push to make sure that Haitians are able to at least have the opportunity to apply for TPS. And it's been on so many levels. There's been lawsuits that have been filed um, after Donald Trump ended 
temporary protective status for certain countries at the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018, including um, Haiti, as well as efforts that have been made through grassroots organizing, efforts that have been made through pushing policymakers. And particularly when the Biden administration came to power, there have been efforts from every corner and area pushing to make sure that Haitians were able to get this opportunity for temporary protective status. It's way overdue. Like, this was a no-brainer, and it's something that should have been done in the first, you know, week of the Biden administration coming into power. But we're glad that it finally has happened. And explain exactly what it means for Haitians living here. So it doesn't automatically mean that you have temporary protected status. And I think that's important to say, because the way that it's being described in the media often is Haitians are getting temporary protective status. And it's not quite that. It's an opportunity. There's an application process that you have to go through. The application process includes biometrics, et cetera. There's fees that go with that. Um, and then there's a background check. Uh, which we'll talk about later, which prevents just those things. So many um, folks who could get temporary status who are eligible, for, you know, prevent them from getting it. But for those who are able to go through those hoops and hurdles, if you are able to get TPS, then you are able to work here. You get a you know work authorization, and you are protected, most importantly, from detention and deportation. So can you... Can TPS be made permanent? I mean, some people have been living here for over a decade. TPS can be made permanent, but not through the administration. Congress has the power to have folks who are right now protected by temporary protected status become permanent residents, become citizens, give some kind of pathway to permanent protections. And that's what, for example, the Dream and Promise Act um, SECURE Act purports to do. The problem that we have as Baji is that there are criminal bars, criminal exclusions that prevent certain people with criminal histories from being able to get that protective status. When you look at who's being detained and deported from Haiti, not expelled from the border, but actually from the interior, over 80 percent of Haitians that are deported are deported on criminal grounds. Not because Haitians commit more crimes than anyone else, but for the same reasons that we see the disproportionate impact of criminalization on African Americans. We're immigrants, but we're black people um, as black immigrants. And Haitians are black people and are going to deal with the same uh, criminal sanctions and criminal bars that you find the African American community. And so, Again, even though this is helpful and it gives people this opportunity, the opportunity does not mean that you have the permanent protection. However, the administration, though it can't grant permanent protection, it has the option to not enforce. Right now, it talks about enforcement priorities. And what we're saying is flip the frame and talk about prioritizing protections just as you do, they do for cannabis. You know, they're not going after big cannabis, even though that's against the law, allegedly, in, in, you know, federal law. They also can decide that they're not going to enforce with respect to immigrants. Um, and in the case specifically of Haitians that we're talking about now, they can make the decision to prioritize protection for Haitians and other black migrants and other migrants in this country. What other nationalities do you think should be getting TPS, temporary protected status, now, Nana? Well, the ones that don't have it right now and that we think should be getting TPS include Cameroon, which, as you know and you've reported on, Amy, is in the middle of basically a civil war. Mauritania, um, where you have enslavement happening right now um, in the ways that it has happened, you know, continuously really, for hundreds of years now. We have 10 Vincent seconds. and Grenadines, sorry, at Bahamas, Guinea, Sierra Leone, um, are also countries that we believe should be getting TPS. And do you believe that black immigrants are cracked down harder at the border? Absolutely. When you look at the expulsions, it's clear. As you pointed out in your opening, more Haitians have been expelled 
under the Biden administration, but it's not just Haitians. It is people from all over the continent of Africa, as well as the Caribbean. Nana Gyanfi, we want to thank you so much for being with us, executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, an issue we will certainly continue to cover. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.